all right, we're here. <laughs> I don't know how, but we are here. All right, let's see. We have one person on here. Oh, no, nobody's on here. All right, it's just me. Let's see, I'm 14 minutes late, and yes, we are still going to go. All right, hold on a second. Let me check. Uh, let me make the announcement on WhatsApp that we're here and we're ready to go. This is crazy. Because when I started teaching, live stream, all right. Uh, when I started teaching, what, 33 years ago, 1987, if you can believe that, probably the age of some of your parents, well, not quite that old, but um, in any case, uh, gosh, I have all these, like, cell phones on, uh, people texting me, people messaging me, Instagramming me, things like that. I, I tell you what, uh, never would have expected this in this day and age. Maria, what's going on? Did um did I answer your questions earlier? I hope I answered your questions. Anyhow, this is the this is the big one. This is my favorite lecture. Um, I don't use notes. I have a couple words written down here on a piece of paper. But um, in my opinion, I'm going to make a video, a separate and distinct video, coming up pretty soon. And that video is essentially um, how to invest, how to build your own you know build your financial house because one thing that I've learned over time sorry I'm getting everything together uh, one thing I've learned over time is man hey Stephanie boom what's happening um, gotta have your financial house in order without that you're always at the you know you're always at the whims and vicissitudes of other people and so kind of the way I look at it is is that you know I worked as a, an investment advisor a financial advisor for years I'm back in that again uh, hi, Yvonne. Uh, Mac Mix. Hello, Mac. Oh, Megan. Okay, sorry, Megan. Um, so I'm going back into that business, as you know, and I was really good at it. I used to get tremendous returns for my clients, and the reason I quit was in 2007, 2008, everybody was chasing me. It's horrible. It's ridiculous. Okay. Well, oh, I guess. Oh, I'm back live. Hello, everybody. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking them if we're live. Uh, can someone tell me if we're on, please? I see there's five of us. All right. I don't know what's going on. It's one of these days. All right, Jen. I'll, I'll talk to you later. I think I'm live. <laughs> All right. Bye. I'll talk to you later. All right. Let's see here. Don't worry. You know, yeah, finally, right, Rachel? Rosa, you're here. Uh, Rochelle's here. Damaris, Isa, um, Angie. Let's see here. Rosa, Angie. Okay, you can see me. All right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm. I, you know, I'm just tripping. I'm tripping. Shouldn't be this hard. But anyhow, I know. I know. It, 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 we live in the 21st century where the internet is very important to us, right? And yet, and still, we can't depend upon it. And people are like all upset about 5G. Well, the 5G can make it so we're connected because we have to be. How many of you, probably none, um, how many of you remember Y2K, right? Um, Y2K was that whole idea that if the internet shuts down when we go from December 31st, 1999 to January 1st, year 2000, we didn't have, uh, because everything is done binary, 0101s in computer technology that we were afraid at that time that everything would shut down. So people were afraid to be in a hospital, they didn't want to be on an airplane, they didn't want anything to do with technology at that point in time, right? Because we were afraid that, you know, if it shut down, what would happen? But well, look at it, it's 20 years later, we have, we have NVIDIA creating the most incredible technology as far as artificial intelligence, electricity, um, the flow of electricity, for example, I own stocks in a company called Solar Edge and what they do, I don't know how they do it, but this is what they do, is they store solar energy digitally in a computer system. I mean, I don't know how that works in terms of physics, but that's what they do. And I'm looking at all these things that we have, 5G coming down the road, we have internet, we have computer capability, our phone, this thing is so incredible that, you know, it, it's, uh, it's remarkable, right? So we're sitting here in this technological, and I can't get a live stream going. Are you serious? What? Right. So I'm just sitting here saying, all right, okay. It is what it is. It is what it is. All right. 
So what I was saying was, uh, did you all hear me talk to my girlfriend? If, if you did, because I thought I was offline, uh, kind of let that go, okay? Um, okay, so this is unquestionably, hello, Agile, the most important lecture of the semester. And I didn't get a chance to make a video, but I'm going to make a video and I'm going to post it to you and I want you to watch it because the, the video is going to be entitled something like financial freedom or how to build your financial house or whatever. But what I know is, is that when I take a look at the roots of many of our social problems, when I take a look at the roots of what uh, underlies our greatest ailments, our personal illnesses, not in terms of sickness, but in terms of like anomie, right? I believe it's the fact that we don't have financial freedom. I really do. I believe the fact that we are almost entirely dependent upon somebody else for our well-being. You know, you have to work for someone else. They pay you a wage. I'm getting all kinds of error messages. So if this is very crazy, uh, I, I certainly uh, apologize. But we're always at the will of somebody else to pay us what they think we're worth, right? And I think that, I think Les Miles, or Les, Miles, Les Brown, Les Miles is the coach for, uh, he was a former coach for LSU. Um, but Les Brown has said that um, our financial freedom really defines how we live our lives, right? And so when we take a look at it, and I've certainly had my struggles, I mean, I, my income is terrific, um, and I make a lot more money than I ever thought I would, but that doesn't mean I have financial freedom because I still get paid based upon what someone else thinks I'm worth. I don't get paid what I think I'm worth. I don't get paid necessarily what you think you're worth. And I know probably most of you don't get paid what you're worth. And so within this kind of game, within this kind of matrix, how do we get paid what we're worth? Right? How do we survive in a game that we didn't write the rules to? How do we survive in a game where those who have the greatest wealth are the ones who benefit from us working for them? Right? So how do we manage this. So one of the things that I, I love to discuss, I love to discuss um, building your financial house. Usually in the live class, I'll spend an hour or two, one day, just talking about everything you need to know to build your financial freedom. Because I think, I believe, after everything I've read, everything I've seen, is that so often it's the lack of financial freedom that will make bad decisions. Now we're going to have addictions to things. We're going to make bad decisions in context that we probably ordinarily wouldn't. But I think the driver of a lot of our poor decisions, when we have to think in terms of survival, we have to think in terms of thriving and surviving and all these issues, I think at the end of the day, it really does come down to financial freedom. So what I'm going to do is over the next few days, I'm actually going to make a video. It's a six part video. It's going to have six components and it's going to teach you how to build your financial house, how to build your own business, how to invest your money, how to get out of debt, how to diversify your portfolio. In other words, it's going to teach you, and we're going to talk about it today, it's going to teach you everything you know to build a life of your dreams. Because most of you, I think at this point, are probably between the ages of 18 and 25, somewhere in that range. And what I'm telling you today is something that no one told me, not until I was 27. My first father-in-law taught me about mutual funds, and when he taught me about mutual funds, I said, what's a mutual fund? Eleven dollars an hour? Okay. That's not bad, right? I would take it. As a matter of fact, I would take it because I like to make money on the margins. However, you know, I, I think our worth is basically unlimited. And it's just a matter of us finding that 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 realm, right? I think that really at the end of the day, the one major problem that we have in our education system is that it does not teach us financial independence. It teaches us financial dependence. It prepares you maybe for a job, but it prepares, prepares you for a job where you gotta work and sell yourself to somebody else, right? And I don't mean, you know, in terms of like the human trafficking industry. I mean, we're all here selling ourselves to someone else so that they can profit off of our value, and that's fine. However, it, thank you, Yvonne. But the thing that we're missing is even within that context, how do we create our own financial freedom? And why aren't we taught in school or within our household or by professionals or what have you? Why aren't we taught how to build a financial household? Why is it when you're young you get these applications to fill out a credit card 
um, application. Why do we get that? Why do we get these ideas that we need to go out and get a car loan rather than save up cash and get something less um, for a used car than a brand new car? I know there's a lot of you know, prestige and value in that. It's called the Veblen effect. The Veblen effect is this idea that human beings, because we live in a capitalist society, we're a consumer society. And therefore, we will pay more for an object as it has value. Not because of what it does for us. So, essentially, many of us will go buy a new car, right, off the lot, rather than buying a used car. Because why? Because it brings us more prestige. After all, if I buy a $8,000 Lexus that's a 2010, right, I might as well go ahead and buy a 2020, or 2020, right? Well, why? If the purpose of the car is to get me from my home on 104th Street to my job at uh, Kendall, Miami Dade College, Kendall, why do I need a $50,000 car to do that if all I need is to get there and back? Or maybe I go downtown to Bayside once in a while, or I go up to Boogies or something like that, or I go to Dadeland to see my kids two miles away, which I'll walk it. I'd never drive two miles. i walk it instead. But let's say, for example, I wanted to drive it. Why, why do I need a brand new Maserati? when I can drive a car that will get me there because the purpose is to get me there. But the difference is if I buy a $8,000 hoopty, so to speak, an uh, older car, versus a $50,000 one, that's $42,000 difference, right? And with that $42,000, what can I do? Well, let's just imagine for a second that if you're paying for five years on a $42,000 car, this is $50,000, it's an easier number to work at, and you're paying $400 a month and you do it for five years, right? That's 5000 well, 4,800, right, 4,000, or 400 times 12 is 4,800 times 5, that's $24,000. You turn the car back in at the end of the lease. So you spend $20,500 to get nothing, which is $12,000 more than you would have spent if you bought a used car. Now let's just say for a second that you were able to get 8 to 10 percent return on that uh, $12,000. Well, if you give a baby $12,000, well, $5,000 at birth, and they get an 8% return. They will retire at 65 with two and a half million dollars. I'm gonna let that register. If you have a baby at the point of birth, $5,000, and they get an 8 to 10% return. When they retire at the age of 65, which I know is a long time away, right? They'll have roughly two to two and a half million dollars. Now, what if you gave them 10? What if you had $12,000 instead of buying for that Lexus? You went ahead and bought, you know you invested that money at 8 to 10% return. How much would you have after 30 or 40 years? And many people say, well, I'm, I'm alive now. I'm not, I don't know if I'll be here in 30 or 40 years. You're going to be here. The majority of people on this live stream right now are going to be here in 30 or 40 years. I'm 54 years old. Most of you are between the ages of 18 and 24. 30 years ago, I was kicking it, right? 30 years ago, it was 1990. 1990, out of my second year of graduate school, second year, I hadn't even earned my master's degree yet. I just got out of college, and here I am, 32 years in as a professor. Are you serious? So most of you are going to be here. The question is, are you going to be broke, or are you going to be in control of your own destiny? And honestly, we're not teaching you how to be in control of your own destiny. We're teaching you how to work for somebody else. And the more you spend on that Lexus or whatever car you're driving, the more you spend on these other things, you go to the grocery store, you have to buy name brands, or can you buy the uh, Publix brand? Can you buy the Target brand, right? Do you have to go to Starbucks, or can you make the coffee at home? As a matter of fact, you know, now that I know how to make Cuban coffee, I don't know what it's called, I don't know if it's uh, Pasolito, it's a pastry, right? Uh, and let's see, there's uh, Cafe Con Leche, Coladas, and uh, there's something else, one, one of the other one. But if I can make that at home, right? And I can buy myself a bag of peon, five, five bucks for a bag of peon, get my little silver coffee pot, and I can make myself a pot for three cups a day, which is way more than enough, right? Because they tell me it's called, what, liquid crack? I don't, I don't need liquid crack, but I drank it one time. I had a Mountain Dew, then I drank the liquid crack. Man, I was floating around. I, my, I was all jittery and stuff. Well, you probably only need one or two a day. So, what if you made your own at home? A bag of peon is, what, $3.25? Water's free, essentially. So I can make three cups of coffee, but if I go to Starbucks and get whatever it is, ca uh, not cafe formation, but you know what I'm saying, uh, a latte. Three seventy-five for a latte, or I go to Passion for three seventy-five for a latte versus spending a dime at home. So I'm spending three sixty-five every time I go out. If I put that three sixty-five into a mutual fund, every, and I'll tell you what a mutual fund is in a little bit, 
But if I put 365 away every day that I save in a difference from making my coffee at home versus buying it, right? That's over $100 a month. What could you do with $100 a month? You could retire a millionaire. So you go into Starbucks because you deserve it, right? Versus making it at home, it's the difference between you being a millionaire and you being broke. It's as simple as that. Now the question is, why don't our schools teach us this? Hold on, I gotta take a sip of this. Yeah, I know, I spent a dollar on this. I was mad too. I'm going back through my 50 day thing. I'm starting that um, on July 1st and I'm gonna just drink water and stuff like that. However, I was really upset with myself for spending a dollar six on that can. Here's what I'm saying. Why aren't we taught financial management of our own life? Why? Why aren't we taught that? Because it seems to me, if you were taught how to be financially independent, and you gave yourself a realistic timeline, I think that if you were determined to be in control of your own destiny, it would take you about 20 years, 10 to 20 years, right? And you make the same money if you work for somebody else. So by the time you're 40, 45 years old, you can be financially independent. Why don't we teach you that? Why don't we teach you how to do that? Because the economy would stop, right? Our economic system would stop if we didn't teach you to work for somebody else. If we didn't teach you to work for somebody else at less than what you're worth, you would always make money for somebody else, correct? So, here we go. You ready? All right, Stephanie. Boom. Whoever else is doing it. Stephanie, you know what? Set me up. Uh, Stephanie, can you set up a, a group chat called a 50 Day Challenge? And then invite me to it so that we could actually um, be a part of the same thing because I'm actually I had to like refrain from starting until uh, <laughs> I had to refrain from starting until um, July 1st because that book kind of got in my way. But I'm definitely down for it, and it, it is a great situation. By the way, if you're saving 21 cents today, 42 cents tomorrow, 63 cents the next day, and you keep doing that, you're going to see Stephanie. You're going to have a nice little piece of change. Okay. So here we go. Let's, let's, let's talk about your financial freedom. Right? The first idea that you need to learn, I believe, is that you have to build your financial house. And here's how the financial house works. If you imagine a house, one of those old northern houses where it's made out of wood and has planks that goes up on the outside. right? If you look at the foundation, the foundation of your house has... Thank you, Stephanie. All right, Angie, come on. The foundation of life insurance, you never taught that. Because if you have a term policy, right, you can get, especially, oh my God, at your age, most of you are probably younger than 25, which means you're healthy. And ev eventually, most of you are going to have children or you're going to get married. Or even if you don't, if something happens to you and there's a burial, um, there's going to be money coming from somewhere to take care of all those expenses. At your age, I would surmise that let's say you're 25 years old, you could probably get a $300,000, $400,000 policy right now for maybe $50 a month, especially if you don't smoke, right? Maybe even less. So for the next 35 years, you have $300,000 for your offspring that will carry you until you're 55 and then you can get more. But the idea is with life insurance is that while you're developing and while you're building your life, it is really important that you build a foundation because ultimately what you want at age 55 is you don't want any life insurance at all. You want to have your savings and your investments carry you, right? So if you were to get a life insurance policy to build the foundation and then you eliminate debt, that's your killer, baby. If you're, if you're using credit cards and stuff like that, that's fine. You were, you were drawn into it, but you've got to get rid of it. Right, because let's take a look at it for a second. You get a credit. Sorry, scam likely, my cousin. So, look at how banking works. If you get a credit card at a bank, you got to pay basically anywhere from 17 to 30 percent. Right. So every time you buy a hundred dollars worth of something, you got to pay 37 or just say 20 percent interest on that until it's paid off. So if you pay the minimum, 
off of a purchase is going to take you 30 years to pay it off if you just pay the minimum. So what happens is, is the bank continues to get your money while you're paying that interest. What you're doing when you use a credit card or you buy something on credit, including your car or your house, you are using your future earnings to buy something today. Right? You're using your future earnings to buy something today. So if you buy a car, brand new, $40,000, take a look at how much interest you're paying. If you're paying, you know, say you got a great rate at 11-12%, right? 12% on a $50,000 car, you're paying $400 a month. You don't get to own it. You get to lease it. So five years later, what do we say? That's uh, $24,000. You're spending $24,000 for something you're not going to keep, right? So on the principal, you're paying nothing because you're not going to keep it. Let's say you're buying it, right? So you spent $24,000 on a car now that's worth ten. So now you gave away $15,000. You just gave it away. Here, boom, take it, right? You're letting your money work for somebody else. Now, if you use a credit card, it's the same thing. You're, you're paying 30% on something into the future for now. That's called the future value of money, right? So the banks, they love when you go ahead and spend $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 on a purchase because they're going to get back $12,000, $16,000. That's, that's beautiful for them, right? They give you two, they give you three, four, five, and they get back 20. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't be happy with that? Right? I'll give you five if you're going to pay me 20. <laughs> Are you crazy? Yeah, I'll be glad to. Right? So they use the interest to accumulate your income. Right? That's a great way to do it. Um, they do it with credit cards. They do it with cars. They do it with boats. They do it with uh, houses. They do it with everything. You go into Target. You go into uh, Kohl's. You go into all these different places where you can get an in-house credit. You buy something for $500 now, and then you end up paying $1,500 down the road. And, and what, what have you done? You just threw $1,000 away. Now, what if you use $1,000 for yourself and allow it to grow on its own? Right? Now, watch this. So, the banks are smart because they know that when they get your money, it's beautiful, right, for them. They're going to charge you interest, so they're going to make continue making money. But then they're going to take your money and loan it to somebody else. And when they loan it to someone else, those people are also paying the, on their future income. So everyone's paying on their future income, and the bank is the one that continues to receive the coupon. They continue to receive that interest so that they can stay afloat, which is fine. They're their business. They, they want to stay afloat. But why, why do you do it? You like paying a lot more than what the value of the, uh, the, the merchandise is? Because when you go to the bank, go check it out. I can't make it up. When you have a savings account, you get less than 1% return. Right. 0.1. Are you serious? They're charging you 29% for your credit card, but they're giving you 0.1. Now watch this. So let's say they're giving you 1%. 1%. And you have $1,000 in the bank. That means you're getting $10 a year in interest. Right? So $10,000 on 1%, you get 100. You put $100,000 in, you get a $1,000 return. Thousand dollars is fine, but you got to front a hundred thousand dollars to get a thousand at one percent. Are you serious? But in the meantime, they're making all kinds of money every time you charge it. Now watch this. If you have a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, let me tell you what you need to have a financial consultant so that you can get that money working. You should, you, you should never have more than three months savings in a, in a savings account. In other words, if your bills cost you twelve hundred dollars a month, you need thirty six hundred dollars in liquidity. That is cash. So that if you lose your job, you can pay for yourself for three months. Six months is better, but three months is fine. So if you have $3,600 in the month uh, in the bank, that's okay. But remember, you're not getting any interest on it. You're not getting anything. All right. So let's say, for example, you're getting one tenth of a percent, 0.1 percent. You're getting ripped off. You're almost better off having it in your mattress, and I'll tell you why. Maintenance fee. 495 for me is 495 a month for um, overdraft protection. That way I'm, I'm never zero or under zero. Two, I notice that at my bank I get a security fee. In other words, they make sure that I don't, uh, I'm not victim to identity theft. 695 a month, that's fine. Bounce a check sometime, that's $30. You need to send a wire, that's $35. You need to get copies of your bank statement going back more than three months, 
it's going to cost you $15. In other words, yeah, I'm getting a tenth of a percent in interest for my savings account. Usually most people have $1,000, so I'm going to get $10, $10 a year. But the fees are going to be astronomical, comparatively speaking. So you're almost better to go ahead and keep the money in your mattress than you are to put it in the bank, right? And on top, why do you even have a bank account? The reason why you have a bank account is because most people, not everybody, not everybody, but someone got really smart and created a business called Direct Deposit. So they create this direct deposit, so like I can't get paid unless I get direct deposit. So I have to have a bank account so that I can get paid. So every month I know I have to pay fees just so I can have access to my money. Right? There's only six people here, but that's okay. All right? So what's happening? The banks are making a fortune because you're dependent upon them. Because you're not independent. You are dependent upon the bank to give you access to your own money. That's a beautiful thing, right? And not only do they give you access, you got to pay for the access. Oh, wait a minute. You have a debit card. And I'm at Bank of America, but i got to go, say, the community bank because it's nearby and i got to do something real quick. No, i got to pay $3 fee. If I do it three times in a year where I get a debit, uh, hit the, hit the uh, ATM machine, right, with a three dollar fee. If I do that six times, that's eighteen dollars. Just getting access to my money, eighteen dollars, is more than the ten dollars I got back in terms of interest. I lose eight dollars by having to use my own money. Eight dollars doesn't sound like much, does it? It does when you add it up over time. See, the time value of money assumes this. Everything today has a value into the future. And the question is, how much is the value? Here's what we know. Every year, on average, the value of your money goes down 3%. It's called inflation. Right? So inflation goes up 3% every year. So you're at the bank, and you get one-tenth of 1%. So you get $10 a year off of 1000 But the $1,000 next year is only going to be worth 970 The year after that, it's going to be worth 953 The year after that, it's going to be worth 926 Right? So in three years, your thousand dollars is only worth nine hundred twenty-six dollars. Okay, so one, you're getting eaten up by the fact that you're paying fees. Two, the interest rate isn't giving you anything. Three, inflation. So you got to beat three percent. If you want your money to grow, you have to beat three percent. That's the time value of money. Most of us think in terms of I got to buy this. I need this now. I need this now. I got to have this car. I got to have this car. I got to get to work. Yeah, go ahead. You're paying interest so that the bank can make more money off of you than they take it and loan it to somebody else. I say, buy it. Buy it in cash. Buy a used car, boom, done. Right? I believe in hoopties. I don't believe in buying the most expensive things because that's your future. And here's what I know about people with wealth. Those CEOs we've already talked about, those who control the major institutions, the media, the political institution, economic institution, all those institutions, are there to make a profit. We live in a capitalist society and they're there to make a profit, not to lose money. We're not benevolent as a society, we're here to make money. Right? We're not malevolent, malevolent either, but we're here to make a profit. That's the underlying force of capitalism, right? Is the profit motive. So if the profit motive is to make profit, then we're going to find the angles to do it. And the best angle to find profits is to, ch to pay your laborers less than what they're worth. Because the number one uh, cost to a company is the cost of labor. So if they, have to pay, if they pay you less so that they can make more, they invest, they get their earnings while you get less. And then you go out and pay interest on something that you necessarily can't afford. Next thing you know, you're getting hit at the bank. You're getting hit in terms of interest rates. You're getting hit in terms of what you make. So every time you make that $11 that you're talking about, that $11 is only worth 3 And then most of us don't save any of it. Right? And I'm not talking about saving in a bank, I'm talking about investing it. Right? Because here's the, here's the time value of money. The time value of money is the banks already understand how this works. That's why they do this. But we don't teach individuals in a classroom how to use the time value of money for their own good. Why? Because the institutions are designed for you to work for them. The are you serious? We have an education institution in which it, it's still based upon mass production of education where you have 20 and 30 and 40 people in a classroom, right? Don't you think that I, you would learn better if it was like five to 10 people where the teachers knew you, they knew your dreams, they knew your ambitions, and they taught according to that? 
rather than worrying about what you get on the uh, proficiency exam at the end of the year? What if they taught you instead how to be proficient in your own life? The whole education system would be different, but it is set up specifically so that you will work for somebody else for the rest of your life. And while you're doing it, you put the money in the bank, and then you get charged fees out the wazoo. And in the meantime, the company owner makes the money 360 times more than the average employee is what the CEO makes. And at the same time, you fall further and further behind. Why? Because that 3% adds up. That 3% adds up over time. Right? That 3% inflation. So what's a thousand dollars now let's say a thousand dollars in uh, 1980 is only worth maybe 250 dollars now right so what do we what how do we combat that why do we even try you know why we try because you're great remember what what is this <laughs> i'm speaking to you and cortana comes up oh thank you cortana might as well have Alexa over here and Siri over here and Cortana. Jeez, it's not like I'm married to three people. Every time I say something real loud, they come up. Um, but I don't have Alexa or Siri. It um, freaks me out. But anyhow, you have an option. You have an option. I'm going to teach you how these options work. All right? One, people. Get your life insurance. There is nobody on this planet. We have now crossed 250,000 deaths from coronavirus. This is what, June just about to turn to July. Last year on July 1st, the disease didn't even exist. It didn't even exist. Let alone 250,000 people predict they were going to die from something that didn't exist yet. Do you 11? Do you, <laughs> you like Siri? <laughs> you can have Siri. My kids like to play with her and say bizarre things just to see how she responds. 3,000 people died on September 11th, the year 2001. Now, one of them predicted that that was their last day. No, no. But did they have insurance? Right? Every time I look out in the Palmetto, someone's dying in a car crash. Most people didn't predict it. Right? Get your life insurance. It's really important. The younger you are, the healthier you are, the less your premiums are going to be. That's step number one. Step number two, get rid of those damn debts, man. Those debts are ridiculous. They're going to kill you. They killed me. I'm paying them all off, but I I have a different situation. You know, I incurred debts because, you know, former marriage, alimony, make sure my kids have a life that I didn't have, all that kind of stuff. However, my debts are gone. I didn't have debts before that marriage. I'm not going to have debts after that marriage. I'm going to take care of all that stuff. Third, right, get three to six months savings. Now right? you're building your house. Eliminate debt. Three to six months savings. Now you start to invest for your future. Now you put the money to work as if you're wealthy. And you don't have to do it in big chunks. I'm going to explain this here in a second. Just little pieces. That little $8, put that $8 to work. Right? And I'm going to explain how that $8, let's just say 10 how it can grow. Then after that, after you invest for your future, invest for retirement. Then if you have kids, then you invest for your kids' education. Right? But ultimately, at the top of the house, and this is where we fail miserably in terms of teaching people. We fail miserably because nobody is teaching you how to run your life as a business. And no one is teaching you that you should have a business. You should have your own business, even if you work for somebody else. You should have something on the side that you're building. And that whatever you're building on the side should be based upon your passion. Because if you're passionate about it, it's hard to build a business if you don't give a damn about it whatever it is you're selling. But if you have a passion, it's hard, right? Because it's a lot of it's a lot of work and a lot of effort. But if you think about it this way, you put in eight hours a day to work for somebody else so they can exploit you so that you can't make money when you go to the bank. What if you worked eight hours a day for yourself so that you could build yourself? Because you know you're not gonna fire you. You're gonna give yourself a raise whenever you can. As a matter of fact, if you start working for yourself, even if you're working for someone else, at some point, if you're doing it out of passion, and you're doing it based upon your networks, at some point, what you're going to have is financial independence. And there are ways to build your own financial independence, your own world based upon the world that you want to live in, the world you see, your greatness. You can build around your greatness so that someday you don't have to work for others, so that if you can work independently, you can actually live a beautiful, beautiful life on your terms, not somebody else's terms. And that is huge. At the age of 54, I wish I had known this, but I, did, I love teaching. See, that's the thing. I love teaching. I love being in a classroom. However, I'm at a point now where I've, I've realized 
I can teach differently, right? I can teach at a, as a coach, I can teach um, seminars, I can teach boot camps, I can go to companies and do trainings and stuff like that. So I can teach, but I do like being a professor, which, you know, is a little trade-off in terms of income, but it was worth it. But I still need financial independence, right? Because who knows? 10, 15 years from now, Siri, I see you see uh, Yvonne, Siri's, Siri is the best. Well, Siri is smarter than I am. Artificial intelligence is smarter than any of us. So you ask Siri a question, she's going to get the answer right more times than I am. So I'm replaceable. So therefore, I have to do something that's irreplaceable. And what am, what's not going to replace me is myself. So life insurance, eliminate your debt. Um, build your three months of savings, start investing, then start um, saving for your kids, and build your own business. And I don't care, I, if, and I know that nobody wants to, it's hard to put forth the effort, but baby, if you're not building your own business, you're not building your own business, you're saying, you're, you're saying to the gods that I am perfectly happy with being exploited for less value than what I'm really worth. And that's fine. That's how our society works. That's a cultural ethos. And so there's nothing not normal about it, but I want greatness, baby. I want you to be up here in the stratosphere when you look back on your life. Now watch this, here we go. Now we're about to get into the real stuff, baby. We're about to get into the real stuff. You ready? How many of you have ever heard of the rule of 72? I've asked this question to hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Nobody knows the rule of 72. They definitely don't know the rule of 116. But yet and still, those two rules alone will change your life forever. Forever! So why aren't you taught what those rules are? You know why? Because society, the institutional system, wants you to work for them. Why is there poverty? Because we need poverty to drive down the overall wages. If there is poverty, it creates a suppressive force on wage inflation. You can't increase wages if there's somebody who's going to replace you. So if you're working for $11 and you say, you know what, I don't want this job, there's someone else that'll take the job from you. Fine. That keeps the wages lower. Wage suppression, right? Which is fine. It's okay. But if you knew the rule of 72 or you knew the rule of 116, you see the world a lot differently. Here it is. All right. The rule of 72 and the rule of 116 is the same thing. The rule of 72 means this. I'm going to do a video and I'm going to put it in your, um, I'm going to email it to you. You can watch it and you can share it. And if you need help, you know, I, I'm actually licensed to help you with this stuff. My partner, Nick, can help you with this stuff and whatever. Um, so whatever seems foreign is really not foreign. I, I, I am licensed to do this stuff. But in any case, here's the rule of 72. If you take your interest rate and divide it into 72, that tells you how many years it's going to take to double your money. All right? So if you have $10,000 and you get a one-tenth of one percent return at the bank, 72 divided by 1%, 720 years to double your money. All right? If you get 1%, it's going to take you 72 years to double your money. Watch this. What if you got 10%? Now it takes seven years to double your money. So you don't have to work for it now, baby. You're just letting it sit there in a nice portfolio. And we'll talk about what a portfolio is here in a second. Or definitely in the video. So you invest your money, and you get a 10% return, which is really, it's not easy. But if you pay attention, it's easy. There's ways to do it. So if you get 10% every seven years, it'll double. So now... I'm, I'm 54, when I'm 61, my 10,000 is worth 20. When I'm 68, it's worth 40. Because it's not doubling off of 10, it's doubling off of 20 now, it's 40. If I happen to make it to 75, it's $80,000, right? Is that right? Whatever. So if you keep doubling it every seven years, boom, you got some money. Now watch this, ready? The rule of 116 is the same. If I divide 116 by the interest rate, say 10%. That means every 11 years, my money's going to triple. Boom. Now here we go. Are you ready? You just had a baby. And you give, I'm going to run it to $10,000. I don't know what the math is going to be. 
that I haven't done this in my head, but I know what it is if you give them five. So if, as a baby, you get $10,000, right, at a 10% return, which is very possible. Because the average return on the stock market since 1929 has been 11%, and we're going to talk about odd lots here in a second, right? But you don't know what odd lots is. Don't worry about it, but it's very important. All right, so by the time this child is 11 years old, right, at a 10% return, that $10,000 is now going to be worth 30. When they're 22 years old, your age, it's going to be worth 90. They haven't put anything else in. They only did it one time. When they're 20, when they're 32 years old, it's worth 270. Right? 270. When they're 43, it is 810. When they're 54, it's 2.4 million. When they're 65, it's 7.2 million. Say they own, right? 7.2 million dollars. All you did was put 10% in at a 10% return. Now by the time they're 76, because I'll never touch my money, where was I at? Seven, $21 million, how about that? $21 freaking million, and you started with 10. And you're gonna tell me that you can't have everything you want? Remember, at 40, that's when they crossed over $800,000. So if you want to start your own business at the age of 40, you could take $200,000, still have $600,000 over here, and then build whatever you want with $200,000. Let's say you didn't need the money. Now you can pass it on to your grandchildren. You can pass it on to your children, right? Just get a 10% return. Why aren't you taught that in school? Why aren't you taught that if you, the time value of money can save your life? Because here's what we know for a fact. Here for a fact, I know Social Security will be here when I'm, when I'm 65, when I'm 67. I won't draw it until I'm 72 because... At 62, I'd get $1,300. At uh, 67, I would get $21 or $2,200. But at 72, I'd get three or 4000 So I'll just wait till I'm 72. That's why I'm not going to retire for another 18 or 20 years. Because I want max. I want to maximize my outcome. By the way, what are they doing? They're doing the time value of money. Why can they give you more? It's because they're getting interest by not paying you. The less they pay you, and the more that lump multiplies, the more they can pay you out. See what I'm saying? But for you, we don't know if Social Security is going to exist. We don't know. We don't. We know there's not going to be pensions. So you're not going to walk into a company like our grandparents did and know that they're going to pay you for the rest of their life because all they got to do is file bankruptcy. And when they file bankruptcy, all their debts are gone, including your pension. So you work for somebody for 30 years, which doesn't happen anymore, but let's say it did. And you work for someone for 30 years, and all of a sudden you get a pension. They file bankruptcy. Your pension's gone. What are you going to do? You didn't save for yourself. You didn't use the rule of 72, nor did you use the rule of uh, 116. Now who's in control of your life? The state. The state's going to determine what you eat, where you live, how you live. Or are you going to take control of that? Hey, Sam, what's happening? Baby, you need to take control. Now, at your age, let's say you are under the age of 25. I can make you a millionaire. I can guarantee that you'll be a millionaire by the time you retire. And here's how you do it. It's easy, man. It's just so easy. I don't get it. I don't get it. They don't teach us this. I didn't learn this until I was, when I learned with my first wife, her dad. Uh, he taught me everything I knew about mutual funds. And here's what a mutual fund is. Like an individual stock is where you buy shares in an individual company. So, for example, I own NVIDIA. I love NVIDIA. I think the future is going to be revolving around artificial intelligence, large data storage, self-driving cars, all that. And NVIDIA, to me, is the leader of all these industries. So I buy NVIDIA. NVIDIA right now is $375, well, it's $370 a share. I originally bought it at $100 a share in 2017, sold it, bought it back at uh, $275, no, $175, now it's up to $370, which is fine. I don't have any problem with the 67% return in four months. No, no problem at all for me. Right? But one share of NVIDIA is risky. Because what if it went down? It went down. I owned it at 250, went down to all the way to 125. I sold it at 225, and I saved $100 on the downside, but I got lucky, right? But what if I own a mutual fund? So I can either own individual shares of a company like NVIDIA or Apple or whatever, or I can buy a mutual fund, and a mutual fund holds a basket. It's like a basket 
that holds a bunch of different stocks. So let's say I like large cap tech companies, NVIDIA, Apple, Microsoft, those type of companies. I can buy a mutual fund that's called large cap growth where I can put money in a large cap growth mutual fund and that mutual fund has all these different stocks that it owns. So I own little itty bitty pieces of NVIDIA and Apple and all that kind of stuff. But what it does is it spreads my risk out. Buying stocks is great, but man, you've got to know what you're doing. You've got to know how to research it. You've got to know what you're looking for. You have to have some art to go with the science of it. And it's a great tool, but you can lose everything if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. Right? But mutual funds allow you to spread the risk out. So even if one stock goes down and there's 100 in the basket, if one stock plummets today because, you know, uh, their tests didn't come through for their new pharmaceutical. Well, all your other pharmaceuticals aren't going to go down too. Not at 10, 20%. I had one that went down 75% in one day. But I only had $500 in it, so I, I was cool with it. I knew it was a high risk thing and it dropped 75%. I was hoping to go up 75%, but I was only using play money. I was diversified, so I didn't worry about it. It was my alternative investment money. Right? So, you get 10% can buy into mutual funds and just let the up and down of the market not worry you. If it can go up and down like this, and either way you win. If it goes down and you're putting in the same amount of money every single month, then you get more shares. If it goes up, then you have more value, right? But if you're not going to touch it for 25, 30, 40, 45 years, it doesn't matter how much it does this because ultimately it's always going to go like this, right? Because the average return in the market has been 11% since 1929, since the Great Depression, right? It's been higher since 2008. So all you gotta do is every month do the same amount. It's called dollar cost averaging. And I'll explain that here in a second. So watch this. But with emotion, we buy high and we sell low. And therefore our returns are much worse than what they should be. Well, my bit rate is lower than uh, the recommendation bit rate. I don't even know what that means, so whatever. All right, so what happens is people buy high and they sell low instead of buying low, selling high. Go back to that Lexus. You like a Lexus, I like a Lexus. And let's say it's a $50,000 car and I walk up to the lot, I'm euphoric. I look like I look like Deku when I'm about to meet All Might in uh, My Hero Academia. Oh, All Might. And I see the Lexus, I'm like, Lexus, I'm gonna buy that. The sales guy says, oh my God, look at this guy. He loves this car, it's $50,000, but because he loves it so much, I'm gonna sell it to him for $75,000. He'll feel really great, right? None of you are gonna buy a car that's sticker price, $50,000, you're not gonna buy it for seventy-five. dollars I know you're not, right? So what does that mean? What if they said, I'll sell it to you for twenty-five? dollars What is going on here? This is ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> All right. It says I need need to use a, a stream bit rate of twenty five hundred kbbps, baby. I don't even know what that is. How am I supposed to do it? So you go to the Lexus dealer, and instead of spending fifty. You'd prefer to buy for 25, but you wouldn't spend 75, right? Because you know it's not worth the value. But when it comes to stock market, people buy and sell off of their emotion. When it's going up, they buy. When it's going down, they get scared and they sell. Mutual fund companies that use rational price points, they know that you're going to sell, and when you sell, they buy everything cheap. So their returns are always going to be greater than yours. So what do you do? Maybe you gotta have a strategy. It's just like everything else. You gotta have a strategy for your life. You gotta have a strategy for your money. Without those, how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna have financial independence if you don't have a strategy? So here's what you need to do. You always need to inventory and figure out who you are, what you are, where you're gonna go. And then you start to build your team. And we talked about all this. Build your team, build your resources. Once you build your team and your resources, now you need to put aside $250 a month for the rest of your life. If you put away $250 a month 
from the age of 21 until you're, say, 35 or 40, say 40. 20 years, that's it. You put away 250, that's, that's uh, 2,500, that's 3,000, 3,000 times 20 is 60,000 dollars. So you put away $60,000 over the next 20 years. Sounds like a lot, but over 20 years it's not that much. It's 3,000 a month, right? But when you retire, you're going to have over one and a half million dollars. So you put aside $60,000 over the next 20 years, and you retire with one and a half million, two million dollars. Not bad. But what if you start at the age of 30 or 40, and you put away $250 until you're 65, right? Now you're putting away almost $100,000 a year. And you're not going to have a million and a half. You're going to have three or four or five, six hundred thousand dollars. You're going to have half the money because you waited longer to start putting it away. Why aren't they teaching you this? Because they want you to be dependent upon the system. As long as you're dependent upon the system for your wages, for your income, for your food, for your shelter, you will never have financial independence. As soon as you make the decision that yes, I like Starbucks, but the, the Starbucks coffee is not worth me being broke when I retire because you have no guarantee that the government's going to have any social security for you. You don't know if you're going to have kids that will take care of you, and what are you going to have? Nothing. Who's going to take care of you? You're going to have to sit there hopeful that someone else comes up with a plan to take care of the population when, in fact, you could do it yourself. Build your house. Diversify your portfolio. Dollar cost average. That is, put the same amount into your mutual funds every month for the rest of your life. And you will never be dependent upon anybody else when you get older. And if you start doing that, when your opportunity comes to invest in yourself, invest in your own business, you won't have to worry about a bank and your credit score because you will have your own resources. You already have your own team built. So if you have your own team built and you have your own financial resources to move forward, then guess what? You're financially independent. And you become one of the few. You become one of the 5%, baby. And let me tell you what. I'm not quite there. But I'm getting really close. And had I known this when I was your age, I've been financially independent now. Oh, last thing. No one ever talks about this. I will. I'll, I'll talk about this. So my father-in-law taught me about mutual funds in 1990. Well, he wasn't my, he wasn't my uh, father-in-law then, but he was future father-in-law. So he starts teaching me about mutual funds in the fall of 92, summer 92, somewhere in there. And I bought a what was called Janus Fund. It's a no-load mutual fund, which means you don't pay any um, commissions up front. That's all you need to know. No commissions up front. So I put fifty dollars away, and he said, "You're never going to miss the money." I said, "Yeah, I don't know, fifty bucks, man. That's a lot of money for me." He said, "Nah, just you'll adapt." So I put away fifty. I didn't even notice it being gone. The next day, I got a, the next month, I got a statement that said I had fifty dollars and thirty-six cents. I cried. I cried in front of this man. He said, "Why are you crying?" I said, "I have never once in my life earned money that I didn't have to work for. Never once." And so, between, by 93, I moved it up to 100, 150. I, remember, I was only making 750 a month as a graduate student. I wasn't making any money. And because his daughter, I didn't you know, want her to be struggling, so I went ahead and got another job. And by 93, 94, I'm an assistant professor at Capital University. I'm a lecturer at Ohio State, making about 27, 32,000 dollars, about 34,000. It's not a lot, but it's a, it's a nice little piece. Well, I was used to having nothing at all. So what I started doing was, is I got us a nice little place. I bought a car, um, uh, Acura Legend. Oh my God, White Lightning. Boom, that was my car, baby. I'm not even lying. Boom, I love White Lightning. That car, stick shit, man. I used, it used to drive itself, baby. Anyhow, so I bought that car. It was 275 a month. All my bills paid and said, probably spending about 1100 a month total for everything. Water, gas, electricity, rent, the car, everything. So it left me 1200 a month to invest. So I started putting away $1,000 a month. And when I got a professor job at the University of Louisville, now I'm putting away 20% of my income, 500 plus. They match the pretense, and I'm putting away 1200 and I invested 1000 So I'm putting away about 1600 a month. 
between 1993 and 1999, I went from being zero to $150,000 in cash and um, property and everything that I had in terms of wealth. Zero two hundred sixty thousand dollars in six years. Let me tell you something. It can be done. The question is, do you have the discipline to do it? Right? Do you have the discipline when you get a quarter to put it in a jar and never spend it? When you save something at Publix, right, it says at the bottom you save two dollars and thirty five cents on your bill. You haven't saved anything if you don't put it away. Because if you turn around and spend it, you didn't save a damn thing. So if you spend $20 and it says you save $225, take the $225 and put it away, right? You put away those little pieces and you do it every day. Next thing you know, you're putting away $50, $60, $70 a month. My first wife, Julie, she said, I said, let's fill this jar as a Tootsie Roll jar. I, she said, what's that for? She said, saving coins? Are you serious? Why not save dollar bills? I said, forget the dollar bills. If you save your coins, you'll have a fortune. And I'm like, I said, just do it. Just do it. Let's just do it. I said, how much do you think would be in there at the end of the year? She said, I don't know, two or $300. I said, that big-ass jar? I said, there's going to be a lot more than two or $300. I said, I think it's going to be about eight or $900 if you fill that jar. We filled that jar at the end of the year. There was $900 in there. And she's like, I cannot believe we saved all these coins for $900. She said, that's unbelievable. I took the $900 and I put it in mutual funds. The mutual funds got a 25% return. So now that nine, let's say a thousand, now that thousand dollars is worth 1250, right? 25% return the next year. Now all of a sudden it's worth what? $1,600. But I'm still adding on to it, right? So you keep adding and adding. You don't even notice it being gone. Next thing you know, you got a hundred, couple hundred thousand dollars. If you do it over a long enough time, you'll have a million dollars. And if you do it till you're retired, $250 a month between now and your retirement. If you're 21, you'll have $2.4 million. And you can stop investing at the age of 20, at the age of 40. If you continue, it's going to be even a lot more. Therefore, what? You got to invest. You got to invest in yourself. Here's my advice. Get your life insurance. Because that's your foundation. Clear off your debts. Don't ever pay anybody more than what they're worth while they're exploiting you for less than what you're worth. Three months of savings, invest for the future, your children's education, build your own business. If you do those five or six things, you will have independence for the rest of your life. And trust me, you won't be worried about a stimulus check coming from the government. How's that sound? If you lose your job, but you won't lose it because you're working for yourself, then all of a sudden something magical happens. You're free. You're free from the exploitation that this system is designed to do to you. Your kids are free. Your grandchildren are free. And guess what happens? When you do what you love, and you do it with passion, you live a life of joy. And trust me, at the age of 54, I realize it's about joy, it's about happiness, and it's obtainable. So, I'm actually going to make a video based upon this, um, and you'll be able to access it. And then what I'm going to do at that video is I'm going to put in a couple links. So if you want to get started with investing, um, I can have you link in, or you can contact me. I'm going to put in my other, I got all kinds of emails. It's called hopeworks.financial at gmail.com. And Annette, my partner, she and I will work with you or whatever. And I don't need the money, so don't worry about I'm not doing it for the money because I have enough income. I'm on a crusade at this point. My crusade is really simple. Anyone that comes in contact with me, I want to be the one that helps them produce the financial freedom of their life. I want you to be in control of your life, not somebody else. And if I have to do this until the day I die, give you the confidence to see that you're capable, allow you to see the greatness that lives within inside you, and give you a path where you can develop your financial freedom, where you don't have to be dependent upon anybody else, that's a hell of a good goal. And that is what my life is dedicated to. So if you are interested in any of this right now, you can send an email to sean.hopeworks at gmail.com, or you can send it to hopeworks.financial at 
um, gmail.com because I am dedicated to making sure that you live a life that I never had a chance to live. At this point, I said we're family, right? Since we are family, it is my obligation to teach you how to stand on your own feet and not be dependent upon somebody else telling you what your value is and what you should be doing. Now here's an announcement about class. You're going to like this. All your written work that you're behind or you're caught up on is due Sunday, July 5th. No final exam. None. No Zoom, no nothing like that. As a matter of fact, what I may do is I may go ahead and set up a time where we can all get together at Lime, at Dave Land, the, the restaurant Lime, where we can meet each other. But I'm going to do this in safety because, you know, Florida's exploding off the map now in coronavirus. But I would like to meet you all, so I'm thinking that um, create a group chat for me, uh, if you don't mind, Stephanie. And then what we can do is, um, on the group chat, we can come up with a time where we can all meet. No final exam. Get all your work done as in the announcement schedule. Submit that by next Sunday, or this Sunday, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sunday, July. What is the date? Yeah, July 5th. And we're good. And what I'm going to do is I would like to know how many of you want me to make this video, this investment video, um, six, ten-minute parts where you can learn everything you need to know and carry it with you. Um, let me know through email that you're interested in that because obviously this freaking group chat's not working, um, and I'm going to do that. And let me just tell you that uh, we can get together at Lime either Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. That would be the 5th, 6th, or 7th. We can just introduce ourselves, no handshaking or anything like that, and I just want you to know you all have been fantastic. I hope this was helpful. I hope you liked it. At the end of the day, there's only one thing I care for for my daughters. It's the same thing I care for for you, and that is I want you to be able to stand on your feet with strength, with strength, with strength, with pride, and conviction, because you are worth it. Have a great evening. Sorry about the technical difficulties. My best.